Hello, welcome back. It's Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes Boone in Palo Alto. I do emerging growth and venture capital. And this is the 10,000 Startups Podcast, where each week we bring you an episode on an issue of startup law of interest to entrepreneurs, founders, and investors. And today we have Peter Helpern to talk about what startups need to know about insurance. And you're going to be surprised at how much there is and how important it is and what the fundamental legal concepts are you need to keep in mind. Peter Helperin is a partner in the Insurance Recovery Practice Group in Haynes Boone's New York office. He's a Chambers USA ranked attorney. He has a standout reputation for expertise in policyholder representation and goes above and beyond for his clients and is a force for good in the industry according to Chambers. He's well known for his work with high value claims such as business interruption, cybersecurity, wrongful death, and all sorts of insurance issues. So thanks, Peter, for being here. And let me kind of dive right into the topic uh, and ask you, what, uh, what do startups need insurance for? I mean, what kind of risks should a startup be insuring against? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Roger, for uh, for having me. Um, you know, I've worked with a lot of uh, emerging companies, a lot of startups, a lot of mature technology companies as well. And I think what's interesting is a lot of what goes into being in a startup is, is being a risk taker, right? These are people who are looking to uh, disrupt current industries or create new industries or develop new technologies or new ways of thinking. And in many ways, uh, it's the epitome of risk, right? You're going out there and you're taking risks, you're taking chances. Insurance is kind of the opposite end of that realm, right? Which is protecting you against risk and hedging and making sure that um, whatever risks your business has, uh, there is a potential bottom line protection against those risks. And that bottom line protection really comes in one of two ways. Um, one is, and we can talk about the kinds of risks, but one is defense, right? So your insurance company is either defending you if you get sued or providing you with a lawyer to manage that defense uh, or reimbursing you or some combination of those things uh, when you do get sued. And then the other aspect of it is uh, indemnity. So funding settlements, uh, you know, funding judgments, funding things that that go to some kind of a conclusion. Um, and then, of course, insurance for all kinds of physical assets and things. But uh, it's interesting to juxtapose kind of the risk taking with insurance, which is uh, risk mitigation. OK, got it. So what, what are the key policies that startups should think about uh, to mitigate those risks? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, some of it is going to be specific to what the business does and the industry that it happens to be in. Um, but there are certain kind of general corporate risks that I think are good to keep in mind. Um, directors and officers insurance, I think that's a pretty big one, right? Anyone who is on the board of a company or has a director or officer position, they're going to want to make sure that if there's a lawsuit uh, against the company or against them individually uh, for their duty or in that function, um, that they're protected. So you're really going to want to make sure you you have something there. Um, once a company becomes publicly traded, there are often issues with, you know, securities, class action lawsuits. Uh, we're starting to see lawsuits now for quote unquote AI washing, right, where they're accusing companies of overstating their capabilities with respect to the development of AI technologies. Um, but even for private companies, right, you could still be uh, under investigation by the SEC for allegedly overstating or misstating um, what you're doing in your performance. So um, important to have that. Yeah. And a DNO policy would would insure against that, would cover the individual. Yeah. So one of the benefits of DNO um, is that DNO tends to have what they call sides, three sides. Um, one is side C, which is the entity insurance. Um, often linked to securities claims. Um, but really for these individuals, they're probably most concerned with side A and side B. Um, side A is going to protect an individual director or officer against liability um, in situations where the company is not indemnifying them. So it could be that the company is financially unable to indemnify them or um, legally unable to indemnify them. Maybe there's some kind of 
bad faith or wrongdoing that, that takes them out of uh, the indemnification obligation. Um, that's a challenge. And then side B is a situation where uh, the company is indemnifying them, in which case uh, the company is is paying those bills and, and reimbursing those costs that are being incurred by the individual officer or director. And then the company is seeking reimbursement from the insurance company. So you have side A, side B, and side C. Um, there can be other ones like side D, which is sometimes outside entity coverage. But for the most part, I think individual officers and directors are most concerned with uh, with A and B. Can I ask you about that? So oftentimes uh, <clears throat> uh, here in startup land, um, I, personally, I think that anybody who's going to be a director would be, you know, would be well advised to have insurance given the litigious society uh, and the VCs will insist on it. So a lot of companies will not incur that expense until they get funded and then they have to. Um, and the VC uh, says, you, I'm going to have my person on your board, so you have to get D&O for them. And, um, but the, you know what? The VC, because we do fund formation here, they've got their own D&O coverage. So what happens then if there's a claim? Who, who covers that? Is it the VC's insurance company or is it the company's? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you the lawyerly answer. It depends. Um, I think as a general matter, it, the question is, who is this individual? What is their role? Who are they a director or officer for? You know, if they're merely taking up a, a board seat, you know, but they're not necessarily in a director or officer role, that may have a different outcome than if, you know, they've been appointed as a director by the VC or by, by the hedge fund or whomever. Um, so that's important where they sit. Um, you also want to look at the policy language. Sometimes they have this, um, this triple situation where um, there may be a priority, right? So maybe first the startup's coverage kicks in and then maybe there's some indemnity obligations between the two companies, right? And then maybe the uh, VC's insurance would kick in. So sometimes that that can be ordered differently, but the idea being there's a, an interplay to be aware of. And I think that's a good issue to flag generally, which is there may be coverage through the activities of the VC, right? There may be um, and that expands to all of these realms, right? The, the, the VC may be kind of extending its insurance umbrella to companies that uh, fall within its ambit. That's not always the case, but I think, you know, from a, a, a fa if you're a founder of a startup and you're thinking about insurance, you really want to explore all these different angles and, and try to understand, um, are we solely working under the auspices of our company or maybe there's some outside entity that could also provide coverage for us. Yeah. And that's true of, you know, even vendor relationships, right? If you're working with a, a vendor, is there a way to, um, you know, offload risk onto that vendor? Is there a way to get on that vendor's cybersecurity policy, for example? Um, so you really want to think about all of these different angles when you're thinking about insurance. And that's good because it reduces costs, right? And it spreads risk. Yeah, um, that's the way I always draft it is that, um, First, the company's insurance will cover it. And then if you exhaust that, then, then the VC, you know, they're kind of on their own with their own insurance. I don't want to leave DNO yet. I have one last thing. The other well, part of this that's interesting. Stay as, stay as long as you want. <laughs> is that you said it's directors and officers. And, you know, uh, Delaware, where almost all the corporations I form are incorporated under, I think it's last year they've uh, they've uh, made some changes in their law that uh, allow companies to protect officers more than they used to. But it sort of highlights the issue that um, officers have liability too, fiduciary obligations, and they should be covered. And people don't really think about that as much. We think, oh, I'm a director, I need coverage. But how many people say I'm an officer, I better ask for coverage. And I think uh, what you're saying is that insurance is available. And then it begs the question, well, who else might be a fiduciary? Like most companies I work with have advisors who don't have any decision-making authority, but they're always a little nervous about it. And I will tell you, we never really get them coverage, but sometimes they ask. <laughs> well, um, you know, you raise a good point. And, and you know, we had the, um, the solar winds incident. And as a result of that, the, uh, the SEC and others went after CISOs, right? So for in my world over the last year or two, there's been a big push to ensure that CISOs are 
covered under DNO policies. And, What's a CISO? Sorry, uh, Chief Information Security Officer. So oh, okay. basically, our our you know cybersecurity professionals who are on these boards, maybe they're not you know key decision makers, but they're involved in managing uh, cybersecurity for a company. Um, they're now getting tagged with liability for their failure to act, or maybe there was a known data, you know, vulnerability or data breach, and they just, they didn't act. Um, now that they're being held personally liable, they're going back to their corporations and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, are, are we covered? And so I've had a lot of clients um, who have made a big push to ensure that their policies are altered so that it expressly covers CISOs. Um, and you're seeing that to your kind of board advisory question, um, that then begs other questions, which is who is included? And so um, my advice always is to, um, if you're not sure, to try to get people expressly named. And certainly if I'm coming in from the perspective of being an officer or director or a prospective officer or director, I want that protection. Similarly, as a board advisor, I think you'd want that protection too. Um, you have to look at the definition under the policy to know who falls within that ambit. But as with the CISOs, you can get endorsements to the policy, so negotiate later changes to add people in. And for the most part, that's not really a pricing issue because it doesn't really alter the nature of the risk, right? It adds more people, but there's a finite pot of funds connected to these policies. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, one more thing to worry about. Uh, so let's move <laughs> on to the next class. You mentioned cyber security insurance a couple of times. I'm gathering that is a really important thing now. Uh, can you tell me what that is and who should have it? Yeah. Um, the second question, first, everyone should have it. But, uh, you know, I think the, the issue is, as you know, um, the cybersecurity landscape is terrifying. There are all kinds of threat actors out there uh, externally who are trying to uh, plant ransomware into into companies and then extort them for ransomware payments. Um, there's also the internal threat, right? Which is someone says, you know what? Screw you guys, it's my last day. Uh, I'm just gonna post this crazy thing online, you know, or I'm gonna open up our books to everyone online or something else crazy, right? So you have internal and external threats. Um, I think regulators are primarily concerned with privacy and data breaches. So the idea of personally identifiable information or uh, health information or financial information getting out there, I think is the primary concern of regulators. And so um, you're seeing legislatures, legislators act in different states to create different kinds of privacy liability. Um, and we have a patchwork throughout the United States. You have GDPR, you've got China, you've got all these other international actors that are doing something similar. And so I, I think the, the big threat really comes in that form, which is protecting yourself against data leaks and privacy. Um, but, you know, if you have a ransomware attack, you've got to pay that ransom or you've got to, you know, get backup systems to avoid paying the ransom. Um, you have all these regulators who may, um, you know, seek to, uh, you know, obtain financial uh, penance from companies as a result of, you know, incidents or, you know, not acting on known vulnerabilities. Um, and there are a couple other attack vectors and things that, you know, we worry about. But basic idea is there's a lot of threats out there. Obviously, there's a lot of companies that invest very heavily in cybersecurity. But as with any other risk, the idea is, should those fail safes fail, and they sometimes do, um, you know, will your bottom line be protected? And that's where I think insurance is so valuable. And I, I think of an analogy kind of like thinking about your home, right? You know, you have a key, you have a, a door on your, your key, keyhole, right? You need the key to open the door. Maybe you have an alarm system, maybe you have cameras. Um, you know, if you have valuables, maybe you have a safe in your home where you keep those valuables. You have all those fail safes in place, right? But if someone breaks down the door, comes in and manages to steal your TV or steal some things, even though you had all of those risk mitigation measures in place, there's still a financial consequence. And to deal with that financial consequence, you have insurance. And it's very much the same with cybersecurity as it is with DNO or frankly, anything else. You know, my experience with cybersecurity is the other benefit um, is that they will help you with if you do have a problem. They'll help you because w when that happens, it's, you know, it's just pandemonium. It's like, what do I do? You know, and 
you know, and, and my experience is the insurance people, they have their own experts that will talk to your IT people and will say, here, do this, this, and this right now. Uh, so, uh, so it's a really good policy to have. Yeah, and to that point, you know, there are some policies that offer what they call pre-breach services. So essentially, they'll give you 50 hours of cybersecurity consulting counseling, essentially, to look at what you have and help you improve. Um, which, you know, can pay for the insurance by in and of itself. Yeah, awesome. The other thing that comes up a lot is employment practices uh, in startups, because especially here in California, where uh, if you're an employer, you've got risk all over the place, even though you might not think you do. Um, can you tell me a little bit about employment practices insurance? Yeah, and, and you said the magic word, which is California, right? I mean, I think California is probably... The, the state that, you know, puts the most fear into the hearts of HR managers and businesses uh, around the country because they have so many robust protections when it comes to employment practices. And they also have very aggressive plaintiff's lawyers who look to utilize those things to, uh, you know, come to a resolution in the event of uh, alleged, uh, you know, uh, liability. So um, there is an insurance product for that, right? And, you know, what it does is, um, coming back to something I said at the beginning, it will provide you with kind of defense and indemnity protection. So either they'll provide you with a lawyer or uh, they will pay for your lawyer or some portion of your lawyer if you don't agree on the lawyer. Um, and then if you have to settle the claim, there will be funds available to help you settle that claim or even pay it in full. Um, the, you know, the, the grounds for liability are uh, enormous, right? I mean, there's run-of-the-mill discrimination and things that you think of as kind of standard, you know, sexual harassment, things like that. Um, but now it, it goes broader, right? You have all of these pay transparency statutes now in, in all kinds of different states where if you don't identify the salary range and sometimes the number of applicants who are looking for um, a job, um, that's a violation. And what makes these claims so scary is that there tends to be a statutory amount per violation. And, you know, the class action lawyers will say, well, 30,000 people were applying for this job or 50,000 people were going to apply for this job. And if it's $4,000 per violation, you know, you're talking about huge dollars very quickly. So um, insurance can help play a role in mitigating those costs and providing you with the defense and trying to push back against those types of claims. Wow. Um, and then the only other one that comes to mind is sort of the obvious one is property insurance and in particular business interruption. I mean, as we're as we're speaking now, there are hurricanes, you know, going across Florida, causing incredible damage here in California. We have a fire season every year. It's right before a mudslide season uh, and, and an earthquake season year round. Uh, so there's all sorts of bad things that can happen to a company. Uh, and I believe that some of that's insurable and some is not. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, and, and I'd also divide kind of the commercial and the, the homeowner spaces, right? Because I think most of the news that you're reading about, Wall Street Journal in particular, has spent a lot of time talking about really the disintegration of the property insurance market in California, in Florida, and other places that have extreme weather events or earthquakes or, you know, wildfires in California very frequently. Um, you know, I think the commercial market's a little bit more robust, but it just means that the costs are going up um, and that people are willing to pay that. So, you know, property insurance tends to protect you against uh, damage to physical assets. So, um, you know, it could be a data center, it could be a retail store, it could be your headquarters, it could be anything else, right? And um, there was a lot of litigation over the last four years because of COVID-19 and the disruption that that caused and whether or not, you know, that triggers coverage under a property policy. Um, but it's a significant uh, source of protection when um, things go wrong, uh, fires, floods, what have you. Um, I think you raise a good point, though, which is, you know, the insurers try to be careful about their risk. And so um, there are certain things like earthquake in California or, you know, flooding in a coastal zone that may be harder or more expensive to come by. Um, and, you know, I, I have a lot of clients uh, with significant real estate holdings and they utilize various strategies to try to reduce those costs. Um, you know, one thing that I think works well is if you, know, you have a lot of property and it's all, 
insured together and you kind of pool risk so that maybe you have properties in places that are in the middle of the country that may not be susceptible to earthquakes or hurricanes. And you can kind of balance that out with whatever risk the middle of the country has in terms of tornadoes, but it, it kind of spreads the risk and can help uh, to reduce costs. But yeah, properties, property is huge. And I think one thing that's interesting about property is that, you know, it, it highlights the interplay between insurance, which is, I think of insurance kind of like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle, right? And, and so to make the puzzle work, you can't have gaps. Um, and so we're always trying to help our clients sometimes when they're buying policies, work through the process so that there may be overlaps, but we don't have gaps. And property is a good one because let's say, um, you know, there's a uh, lightning strike that damages a data center, um, but that has kind of business interruption, cyber repercussions. So how does that play out versus let's say there's a cyber attack that fizzles your data center because uh, I always think of that show, Mr. Robot, you know, they alter the temperature and, uh, you know, the, the data center explodes, you know, that kind of interplay between cyber risks and property risks. And so just really important when you're looking at your policies to make sure that they work together in concert and that you don't have these gaps. Okay. Uh, is there any other sort of general major policies that I haven't mentioned. I know there's like things like M and A insurance, et cetera, which is its own whole podcast by itself. But <laughs> for the basic operating company, those are those the big ones or am I missing something obvious? Yeah, I mean probably the the, the biggest one out there is just general liability, right? It's just mm -hmm. slip and fall. It's it's, you know, bodily injury, it's property damage. It can be um advertising injury too, right? It could be uh um, you know, uh, protection against, you know, false light or, or slander or uh, other things, right? So, um, you know, general liability tends to come up in surprising ways. I, I worked with a um, emerging technology company and um, someone got into a fight over a piece of their property and someone pulled out a gun. And then the person who did not pull out a gun sued. And so all of a sudden this company that very much is in the tech space and focused on, you know, facilitating transactions, I'll leave it at that, finds itself embroiled in a gun battle, you know, literally. L let um, me guess, it was in Texas. <laughs> no, actually, it was in uh, California. Oh, it. no kidding. No. Yeah, it's of all places, and I, I, I won't say where. But, um, you know, I think it, it's, again, one of those examples of where you want insurance to be there with the hope that you don't have to use it. Um, but, you know, our advice is always to make sure it's as good as possible so that when you do use it, uh, it actually helps you. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, so the lingo um, in the time we've got left, which is not much, but you know, I've I've been telling people for forty years that insurance companies are in the business of denying claims, not paying them. So you better read the policy and be careful. You do everything that it says. It's sort of like a game of Simon Says. Um, can you speak to that? Like the conditions that typically have to be satisfied. Let's suppose I have insurance and all of a sudden I have a claim. What do I need to do typically? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I, I think the people say to me, for example, who's your favorite insurance company? And I'm like, I, I can't answer that question, right? Because people only usually come to me when their claim is denied. Um, other than the work we're doing on the front end to help people procure policies, I'm mostly just fighting with insurance companies. So I don't have a favorite. Um, but I, I think to your point, you really want to be careful on the conditions, right? So you have the coverages. It tells you what's covered. You have definitions, which explain what all these bolded terms mean. You have exclusions where they take back coverage and say, no, no, we don't, co we'll, we'll cover you, you know, Monday through Friday, but not Tuesdays, right? Um, you have that. And then you have conditions, which are, we'll cover you on Tuesday, but you've got to, you know, Simon says, hop on one leg. So the conditions are extremely important. Um, in the interest of time, I would say the one to focus on really is notice, right? You really want to make sure that you give timely notice of a claim. Um, Harvard recently had some uh, high profile cases where uh, they lost because uh, they were alleged to not have given timely notice. And I'm not uh, picking on Harvard, but the idea being that that's one of those conditions as an example, that if you don't comply, it sometimes gives insurance companies an easy out. And uh, we're not trying to be in the business of uh, giving them an easy out. Okay. And then finally, just to be clear, what, what is your role typically in this process? Uh, it's not just, you know, the, the company and the, and the insurance broker, right? Yeah. So um, 
I, I typically kind of get involved in three ways. Um, you know, the uh, disputes is probably the biggest one. So a client has something go wrong. They go to their insurance company and ask for coverage. And the insurance company says, you're not covered or you might be covered, but what about this? And basically, there's some indication to them that there's going to be an issue with their claim. Um, and so that's when I get involved and, you know, we kind of go through what I call the escalation ladder, right? So maybe we'll just look at it. And you know, I had one client, I ghost wrote a two paragraph email and all of a sudden the insurance company said, oh, wait, we will cover your claim, right? And that's the best case scenario. Sometimes we have to write a letter. Sometimes we ghost write a letter. Then we, you know, maybe try to have a settlement meeting. And then, you know, if everything fails, you end up with litigation, arbitration, what have you. Um, that's a really big bucket of what we do. Um, another big bucket of what we do is kind of dispute prevention. So that's where the client brings us in to look at their insurance policies and we kind of talk them through, okay, you know, we want to change this term or you might want to think about this or trying to identify gaps and saying, wait a minute, your broker talked to you about this and this, but what about in between uh, and trying to work with them and their broker to get, you know, improve their policies. Um, and then the last thing is, um, it's also along the lines of dispute prevention, but sometimes something will go wrong, like a late notice issue, and the client will bring me in to kind of consult and say, okay, we don't understand how this went wrong. Can you help us work on our internal procedures so that we don't have this happen again? And that's usually pretty simple. That's usually a matter of some meetings, maybe, you know, a protocol, but really oftentimes it's helping people to gain um, awareness of insurance because the biggest issue sometimes is that if you're not familiar with this world, you may not be thinking about it. And again, if you don't think about it and then all of a sudden uh, a lawsuit that was nothing becomes huge, but you never gave notice in the first place, you may not be able to get coverage for it. And so trying to set up procedures so that, for example, if there are any letters, demands, any customer complaints, the company has something set in place so that things don't slip through the cracks. Okay, got it. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Peter. You, you've actually made insurance interesting uh, <laughs> here, which is which is no small feat. Uh, this is Roger Royce with the Ten Thousand Startups Podcast. I've been speaking with Peter Helprin, who's a partner with Haynes Boone in New York. And Peter, I gather people can get a hold of you on the website. They want to talk more, right? Yes, I'm hiding in plain sight on the internet and uh, on LinkedIn. Um, okay. Thanks for having me, Roger. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And we'll see you all next time.